on the show today, Kayla June. So Kayla June, I know as the rolling around the floor lady, because I've been enjoying her uh, online uh, floor work classes tremendously, which are really very good. I've been doing those myself. And she also runs some, something called the Soma Kines School. Am I saying that right? Did I say I'm... Soma Kines. Kines, that's it. Kines. You just told me. It's been a long day, Kayla. It's been a long day. Okay, I've been looking forward to this as the highlight of my day talking to you. So welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And being the highlight of your day, I mean, now it's the highlight of mine. I just woke up, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the best so far. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. Okay. How did you get interested in the body, Kayla? How did that happen? I grew up in my mom's dance studio. So, um, you know, early on dancing and performing and it was my life. So th there it is. And we had a small studio and I was also, uh, you know, a teacher in my mom's studio and a costume maker and a rehearsal organizer and a choreographer and a studio cleaner and managed the moms, <laughs> you know? So it was a, it was quite a learning experience and that's yeah how i came into movement what is they say in japan they say the child who grows up next to the temple does not have to be taught chanting i mm -hmm. sort of just sort of learn through being around it and being exposed to it yeah mm -hmm. that must have been an experience yeah and, and how do you describe yourself now when people say that dreaded question at the imaginary cocktail party because let's face it no one goes to fucking cocktail parties but the imaginary cocktail party when they say what do you do how do you answer that well it's really going to depend on who asks me honestly right so um, i try and formulate my words yep. to kind of match somebody you know that thing i mean um uh, you know, but I've really come back around to being really simple about it, that I'm a movement teacher and that I work with other movement teachers to help other people move and feel better. Great. So you're a movement teacher. That makes it simple. Not too pretentious. I like it. But you're working with other movement teachers. So you're running programs for movement teachers. Yep. You got it. And if, if someone said, like, what's your spec? Now, I know you as, again, the floor lady, but I don't want to pigeonhole you. So if someone said, like, what's your specialism, what would what would you say? Well, I would then talk about what my vision is, because I think that's what makes my work unique, which is right. bringing the movement arts and the movement sciences into a cohesive whole. So in my own educational pathway, you know, I started as a dancer. So that led me into, you know, the more kind of like the movement arts and the discovery based stuff and somatic movement and performance art and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then the questions that I had eventually led me to the other side of what I call the movement education spectrum, which was exercise science and personal training and corrective exercise and function and all of those kinds of things. And what I found out is that the two worlds don't talk and they should. Right, right. Okay. So this is something I think we share is bringing worlds together. It's one thing about the conference and the podcast is communication between different worlds. So what have been like the main chunks of your training then in terms of, you know, is it you know, I'm doing a little bit of your work, just literally just a few hours of classes. It seemed like Feldenkrais, a bit of BMC, a bit of dancey. Like what, what are some of the main chunks that have influenced you? So certainly contemporary dance and improvisation. And then in terms of somatic movement, the kind of biggest influences that, you know, I had initially, and that still are really informative, was that intersection between Bartini of Fundamentals, you know, uh, Rudolf Laban's work and body mind centering. So that intersection, and that's a pretty common intersection uh, that, you know, correlates often with con contemporary dance training and uh, technique. However, you know, I just got so interested in somatics, Mark, what I have to say is that I went on to understand all of the pioneers to the best extent that I could. So I either found teachers or teachers of teachers or, you know, I went into uh, learning from books or went into personal exploration. Um, a really good friend of mine who's been on this path as long as me, Don Hartman, she and I started leading dance laboratories and no, bringing no. together. Yeah. Uh, you knew her. It's yeah. Out in, it's out in Boulder, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're friends. Yeah, we're yeah, friends. She's my longest bestie. Uh, longest, uh, longest okay. Bestie. Yeah. So, um, so then, you know, authentic movement and somatic experiencing um, were, you know, a few others that really became pretty prevalent uh, in terms of transforming my life. 
Um, you know, in terms of Feldenkrais, I know a lot of people come to me and say somatic groundwork feels a lot like Feldenkrais. I've never really gotten into Feldenkrais too much. Of course, I've read his books and I understand who he is. And I mean, he's he's amazing pioneer. But in terms of movement practice, that really hasn't been one that I've okay, interesting. entered into. Yeah, too interesting. much. But yeah, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the somatic groundwork then, just as that's been my sort of point of contact with your work. I'm hearing it's much bigger than that. Um, why would anyone want to roll around on the floor? Let me play uh, chair's advocate. So what, why, why do we want to do that? The work for somatic groundwork began on the floor to kind of start from the beginning. If we're talking about really creating a, an optimal learning environment, there's a little bit of unwinding that often needs to happen. <laughs> um, and Primarily, that comes from befriending the nervous system and giving the nervous system some time to regulate, as people say, or harmonize, as I like to say, but really dropping into parasympathetic tone so that we can be more receptive, so that we can actually learn new patterning, so that we can make conscious choices, so we can come out of the habit, so we can actually find our body breathing itself that whole thing. So one of the most supportive ways to do that is coming into connection with the floor because then we have that additional benefit also of grounding, connection with gravity, this is called yielding, and that's very supportive to our living architecture, to our tissues. Um, so there's also a sense of inner stability and safety that comes from uh, beginning that way on the floor. I guess so, if nothing else, it's like, if you, whether you're dancing or doing martial arts or yoga, you can always fall over, right? And that is a basic fear people have. And if you're doing floor work, you can't fall over, right? Like, you know, like Aikido is all about making people fall over. or Yoga is about doing funny things and trying not to fall over while doing the funny things, which is sort of challenging falling, you know, not falling over. Dancing, we're playing with our edge, you know, and there's always that risk that we could take it too far and fall over. But with groundwork, that... And they say it's the only fear we're born in, possibly with some people's snakes as well. But you know, that basic single, singular fear we're born with of if we're going to just is out of the picture. And then just physically, your muscles can relax more, right? Like it takes a certain amount of tonality to stay sitting or standing. You know, days like today where it's been a long day and I'm underslept, I can actually feel that it's taken a certain amount of effort to stay sitting up. You know, that is, even though if I sit in lovely and poised and my best Alexander or whatever, it, it still, it still takes a bit of effort. Whereas on the floor, there's a like muscle tone can release more just because it's like, it doesn't have to. And then maybe lastly, there's always like this spiritual component to ground. Mm -hmm. You know, we say that's solid ground. You know, is he standing on firm ground? It's like the ground was pulled up from underneath me. You know, I've been in an earthquake and it's a really disturbing thing when that, solid metaphor gets taken away so I, so I wonder if it's sort of those three plus more isn't it that makes ground i love i've been rolling around the floor in aikido for years i love it and mm -hmm. so you know took to your classes very naturally and um yeah it strikes me there's a number of features that combine for a sort of nourishing experience absolutely i mean this connection with the ground is fundamental and no matter what posture we're taking whether we're standing or sitting or in relationship with somebody else we're also always in relationship with the ground and with space. And I kind of, you know, had this aha moment uh, in my early 20s as I was really starting to understand how to use my body more efficiently. You know, I grew up in the kind of very heavy ballet uh, kind of technique kind of training, right? And there's just a lot of work <laughs> in doing ballet, a lot of holding, a lot of gripping, at least that's how my body took it on. Um, and it was very difficult, you know, I was an advanced ballet dancer on point, all that kind of stuff. But it was a lot of work to hold myself up out of the ground. And when I learned that I didn't have to do that, that I could actually let go of all that work and use the floor as my partner, mm -hmm. and then begin to connect into space and be held by space in the ground, suddenly there was this ease and freedom and ability to relate that completely changed everything. You know, there's something about that ballet tradition which underpins so much Western movement of holding oneself up mm -hmm. away from the floor. And, it, and, and like, I still, sometimes I see that as a trauma pattern, particularly some of my gay friends, gay male friends, that this is sort of holding oneself up above the ground, you know, like, ew. Uh, and that's in ballet too. And, and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes that the ground is bad somehow. It's almost like in Western culture that it's lower class, you know, like upper is better. That seems to be sort of built almost into our 
moral system of language is high morals rather than low morals you know there's a way in which that's built into our whole cultural linguistic structure that the floor is somehow hell is down right heaven is up yeah yeah it reminds me of aesthetic and like what we classify as high art versus kind of low art kind of thing and i mean ballet is beautiful and the aesthetic of ballet is you know really really something to marvel at um and it's you know quite quite a feat the ba ballet dancers are athletes in in a beautiful way i found for myself though that i i just got really interested in what's what's my natural being what's my natural body and i don't want to walk into dance class anymore and get ready and prepare on center and suddenly be in this other posturing like who just walked in the door <laughs> and who's going to walk out of here and walk to the street i don't want that to be a different expression uh -huh. That's right. interesting. Do you have to be a different person when you enter the yoga studio and put on the spiritual voice or the martial arts place and put on your tough guy hat? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do I have to be a different person in here? Because if so, I'm going to leave that different person here and it isn't going to go to the rest of my life. Yeah. It's funny, you said on point earlier. I, I got totally confused. This is a military term. So, so on point means to be like in front of the other people on a patrol. Um, <laughs> So there's also a bat that means like on your toes in ballet. Yeah, right? the point shoes, mm -hmm. the hard box point mm -hmm. shoes. Okay, I should do a ballet class one time just to see what it's about. I was in a Gaga class the other day. I accidentally signed up for the pro one instead of the, the public one. They have two kinds of Gaga classes, you know, it's like the, the for professionals and for muggles like me. And then I accidentally signed up for professional and they started doing plies, you know. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I think I was really freaked out, but it's fun though. It's fun. It's different, a bit different for me. You got this, Mark. I, I, got I, it. I, I, was, like, I was like, oh, that's why everyone here looks gorgeous and muscular. I was like, looking at the Zoom, I'm like 20 kilos heavier than any motherfucker on the, sh on the Zoom, you know? I was like, oh, it's the, it's the dancers class I came to you by mistake. Anyway, so what about developmentally? Do you think there's kind of a... My experience of when I did floor work in Systema or Aikido, you know, as soon as I get down to the floor, it can make me like childlike or animal-like. Do you know what I mean? Like it brings out a different side of my personality than when I'm jumping through the air, you know? Like, well, is there something developmental in that lowness to the ground as well, you think? I mean, for me, absolutely. You know, the, the kind of vocabulary of somatic groundwork is highly informed by developmental movement patterning. And so that's not only kind of our, <clears throat> our whole body patterns, but also the, you know, the kind of the underlying support. So reflex activity, um, and then also what we call the fundamental action. So this is yieldings where we begin on the ground and then the pushing force production and force transmission through the fascial matrix and how we choose to use that force through the body. So, so there's that piece. And then by going into these, I would say kind of primary places of movement development, places that we've traveled through before, things that have been adapted and compromised and changed and restructured over time. We have an opportunity to really kind of check into the sensory experience of what's happening. And then the repatterning piece allows us to say, okay, well, how is that affecting my thinking mind? How's that affecting my beliefs? What's coming up for me? I call these perceptual artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and is this actually true? Do I believe that? Or am I kind of just holding that because that's what's there? That's my habit. Yes. And then how does that inform the way I move and relate out into the world? So that's really how we kind of use that sensory motor feedback loop in somatic groundwork. We follow sensations up to perception and then make conscious choices about how we're, we're moving from that. Uh, yeah, from the feedback loop. It's kind of funny, isn't it? People are like, no, this is this is true. This is what I believe. This is the way the world is, and it's like, yeah, that that's a muscular holding pattern in your body. It's like no, it's not really any different than indigestion or a cramp, you know. And yet, it's become a world view. It's become a way of looking. It's become a belief system. It's those things going to hold together that way. So, I just, well, they're all. I mean, as you know, there, I was going to see the comedy of that as you said it. Well, it's all, it's all embedded there, right? So what was a, a muscular holding pattern or an adaptation to, you know, forces that we had to manage in the world or repetitive action or whatnot, 
and also becomes informed by the feeling tone that's underneath that. And then maybe there's some defense mechanism in that or some protection in that. And then suddenly that's just what we do and how we are. And we don't even realize how that's affecting the way we think or um, the way we orient, those kinds of things. And that's why I got really interested in using the body as a primary vehicle for change is that I had some pretty um, incredible, <laughs> life-changing, uh, dark night of the soul kinds of experiences in my own life where it was, oh, moving into my body, into this wilderness here, and then creating change from the body up is also, you know, affects then how I am in my mind. And I was much more interested in body up, bottom up processing than going into the mind and hashing out all this stuff up here to then transform my experience. I, I really just, you know, like the other direction. <laughs> Well, again, you know, we talked to quite a few teachers around this identity level, and it seems like people can have a structure in their body which is sort of help holding together an identity structure. I'm this kind of person. I'm a person who does this. And I, you know, I've heard of people say, you know, hey, I'm a CEO. I stand this way. Or military guys. This is just how you know. This is part of me. And it seems like that could really, really undermine any kind of change work, right? When it's like if it's challenging that the structure of someone's identity is held in the body even if you're able to demonstrate a health benefit or a comfort benefit or you know you're, hey you're just stronger this way you're just more relaxed this way you're happy this way they're like yeah but it's not me yeah now, how do you work with that i think this is a sort of a question quite a lot of teachers i've spoken to have bumped into in one way or another well, recently, and through the guidance of Joanne Avison, who's one of my teachers, and she's one of the primary teachers in the biotensegrity field, she, she mentioned something that helped me connect some dots that have kind of been a through line for me for about 20 years about structure, form, and function, right? Or structure and form and then function. And that was this kind of whole idea about matter and pattern. So we could actually look at pattern as the force that moves through our matter or our structure, our form, and that the two are always informing one another. So the forming of us being informed by the forces that we are negotiating at all times. So this really works for me in somatic groundwork because I mean, I'm just like such a nerd about patterns and all kinds of levels and layers of patterns. Uh, and I draw, you know, geodesic, you know, mandalas and icosahedrons, and I have for a long time because I just learned so much from them. But it's this pattern then that we can start to really get intimate with when we're practicing somatic groundwork. Because again, like you mentioned, we don't have to engage so much of the habit, the muscular armoring when we're on the floor. So we can actually pay attention to some of the details and the pattern. And as we change those patterns, it changes our form and it changes our structure, it changes our underlying being. And we, you know, we see that we experience life differently. It's subtle, you know, it's like small, effective, safe um, kinds of changes that we can make. Well, I enjoy it, if nothing else, running around the floor. So I'll be doing more. <laughs> so I think I've just about, I've just got one more left of the free ones that uh, you gave away online. And I might have to pay for some stuff here. I'm looking at your website. You've got big courses and somatic groundwork immersion. It looks good. And there's, oh, look at that, Magdalena Weinstein. She's been on the show a few times, another, another friend of ours. So she's yes. bringing in trauma work, is she, to the work? Uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited. At the end of the month, we're doing a somatic groundwork immersion. This was going to be a live event until COVID-19. And instead of canceling this live event that was going to be in Boise, Idaho, where I live in the USA, um, decided to pivot and bring it online because the work's too important and feels really important now. And so when I brought it online, I decided to add another guest teacher and I asked Magdalena if she would come in and, you know, deepen our conversation of nervous system harmony. Like I mentioned, it's such an important part of somatic groundwork anyway. And I'm very keen on somatic groundwork being a trauma informed or trauma sensitive practice. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm just really excited that she's going to come. And then I also have Chris Clancy of Embodied Biotensegrity coming to introduce Biotensegrity really the complex system science that describes us, our biology, our living motion. Um, this is going to be a great week. Where are the dudes? There's like four female teachers. I wouldn't get away with that. If I did a course with four male teachers, America would rip me a new asshole. 
like, 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 there's, there's, there's four, four female teams by the looks of things. I don't know. And I want to jump to conclusions. But that, that does looks like there's a lack of dudes there for me. I want to see a guy on there. So Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it in always. I, you know, <laughs> I tend to draw a lot of women to my work. I definitely work with men as well. And they're in the work. But it's... I think the reason for that because I don't, I've done your classes. I don't find them like unfriendly to men or anything. Like sometimes there's a vibe, you know, and you go as a man, I'm not, oh, this isn't good. I didn't get that from you. So I don't, you know, in any way blame you for that. But it's, I'm, I'm wondering, is floor work somehow more threatening to guys? <laughs> like, like, is there? Well, actually in my somatic, so I have a membership program to you called Somatic Groundwork Virtual Classroom and it's a monthly subscription so people can practice. And there's, you know, I would say equal men and women in, in that. But in terms of my, um, bigger programs for movement teachers, like I have a year-long program called Intelligent Motion Training, and then with the immersion, I find in these kind of longer, more intensive offerings that I have, um, I really draw women. It's interesting, the embodiment conference, I asked for some stats off the Facebook ads people that are helping us out, and they've got some, you know, reasonable stats because of the, the number crunching they do, and they said there's 95% women who had signed up for the embodiment conference so far. And um, have we given you an invite to that, by the way? You're super welcome if we haven't given you an official invite yet. Um, in terms of speaking at it or? Yeah, yeah, speaking at it, yeah. Well, I filled out the thing that came out like four months ago or something, but I haven't gotten any feedback about it yet. Let me make a note, hang on. Yay! Yeah, no, I'd love to. So I was really excited when uh, that Google form came through and. Okay, I'll, I'll have a word. I think Rafe's been a bit behind on his department. You'd probably be under the movement department. So that's probably the reason why I will chase that up with Mr. Rafe Kelly. Okay, I want to find out a bit more about you. So did you say you're in one of the square states? I'm in the square states. <laughs> the middle ones, in the middle, the square ones, in the middle. <laughs> Idaho is not quite square. Um, okay. And it's a little bit more like... Uh, you know, so if you were to be in the Rocky Mountains, it's a little bit west of the Rocky Mountains, um, but it's not quite northwest. Okay, so it's not, there's the corn, and then the mountains, and it's the other side of that. So we're not yeah, yet. I mean, not most busy. of Idaho is really heavy duty wilderness, um, and yes. it touches up into Canada. Oh, wow. Okay, so, so is that where you grew up? Is that where you're from? I have grown up between actually one of the square states, Colorado, that's why I laughed, and uh, Montana. And so Montana is directly north. Montana, Idaho. Montana's meant to be pretty. Is Idaho like that? Like I imagine oh, yeah. it's green and sort oh, of yeah. kind of nice stuff. Okay, so you're a bit out of the normal somatic hubs, right? Like Boulder, San Francisco, New York, like you're a little bit away from those kind of hubs of this work. I am now, I've just moved to Boise. So been here three years. And before that, I spent the 10 years previous in the Denver Boulder area. And then I went to school in that area too. Like all of my childhood schooling was in that Denver Boulder area. Why do you do this? Like, I don't know you. So I'm, and I'm, I'm, I want to find out something about you, the person. I know you, we could geek out on the work for a long time, I'm sure. But why do you do this? What is it that has hooked you? Why do I do what I do, like in movement? Why? Why, yeah, why is this your thing? I mean, it's not the money. Let's face it, right? Like, 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 what is it that's like made this your life? Because this is a life's work. You've clearly studied with a lot of people, and you know, put a lot into it. So, how come? It, I, it's my form of activism, and it's the way that I know that I can serve the greater good is to help people return home into a body that feels safe and that they feel like they can befriend and that they can relate with and relate from. Because to me, this seems like one of the core elements of a better humanity overall. I do believe that, and I'm with you on that, this idea of it's an activism of a kind, you're helping people come home to the body and the, the safety and the wisdom therein. Yeah. Why this though? Why particularly this embodied work? Because there's lots and lots of ways we could contribute. You know, you're obviously smart. You know, you could have done a job in an NGO. You know, there's lots of other ways we can contribute. Oh, I'm, a, I'm an artist. I'm a creative person. I'm a movement person. Um, and I'm somebody that's really fascinated by relationships. So I suppose all of those things came together in a unique way. Um, I had some early experiences uh, also, my mom had a significant injury. Mm. I had a significant injury. <clears throat> I had a very significant childhood developmental trauma that came through repressed memory when I was in my late 20s. Uh. So there are these very 
challenging times that were deeply rooted in my body experience yeah. more than in my mind. And they were actually the things that were kind of revving in the engine all along that were keeping me really unwell and kind of in a dis-ease state. And when I started recognizing that and that I could change that or that it didn't have to be kind of the possibility of my experience, I wanted to help others who might be feeling the same way. So that's also there. It's interesting on the show, you know, I've interviewed like 250 people or something on the show now and you start to kind of hear the patterns and like most of us, I say us, cause I'm one of the group of people I'm interviewing, you know, some of it's just accident, like your mum run a dance studio, you know, it's just, it's just an accident of fate, you know, some of it is like our own personal neurosis. We have some sort of wounding, some sort of damage, you know, like for me, it was a very bad experience in school and education and just going shit, like that's education. There has to be a better way, you know, and then other, others, it's also this usually this third thread of sort of some sense of like, hey, I could really contribute this way. Like that's a, seems to be a human calling. So I was kind of thinking out loud here how those three fit together. You know, there is usually some sort of a slightly neurotic tendency with a healing tendency on the other side of that, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, yeah, I got curious about this, seeing the patterns of interviewing many people. The, the, I think the piece of being an artist is a big piece, is a big part of it for me. And I had to, at some point, um, first marriage, I'm divorced. I have two kids that are young elementary school. And up to that point, my movement world had largely been in art and performance and oh. kind of, you know, choreographic creativity and, and all that kind of stuff. And I remember this day of going, okay, I need to figure out how I'm gonna make a living in movement. And I don't really think for me, it's gonna be in performance to raise these kids. Like some people might be able to stick that out and are that good or are that clear about it. I'm like, oh, what do I need to do? And I'm in the Denver Boulder area at that time. I thought, okay, is it Naropa? Is it PT school? Is it occupational therapy school? Is it dance therapy? Do I get them? Oh, where do I go? What do I do? <laughs> Right. So, you know, at, at every step of the way, it's been a question of how do I keep doing movement? Because that's the thing that just runs through me. It downloads, it uploads all the time, you know. Um, running a business for many of us is like that, isn't it? Almost like, how do I just keep doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, hey, I love this. How do I keep doing it? Where's the business in this? You know, that's like an afterthought, I think, for many of us. None of us got into this as entrepreneurs, you know, like we, none of us were like, Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. This is a good opportunity. Right. That wasn't, that wasn't really the thinking. And it's, um, you make some distinctions there. Like, I wonder if some people are more performers, Like, I quite like being on a stage, giving a speech, you know, uh, like a Ted talk type thing. And so, you know, some of the Instagram people are more like performing that way. You know, they like the visual performers and other people are more artists. It's more about just the creation, the, uh, exploration i definitely have that side of me you know constantly learning constantly creating some of us are more teachers naturally that's probably my strongest urge is to teach actually like if i wasn't teaching embodiment i'd be teaching pottery or creative writing or something something else you know like my grandmother taught driving a car um but it seems like there's these sort of mixtures of callings and embodiment teachers mm -hmm. I, I feel blessed that i've got a bit more of the businessman side than most people in this field you know not much, but even having 10% of it is, is a sort of lucky thing. And it seems like you've taken that side of it fairly seriously as well. When I got into personal training, I really started learning the business. And I'm really grateful for, uh, you know, personal training as a field to help me learn the business of selling your service and how to do that in an authentic way. So that's, uh, yeah, one of the big skills that emerged for me during that time. And then... Uh, you know, I went on to get a master's in exercise science. It was actually a, a scholarship that I was gifted. And once that occurred, I realized, okay, like I now have been given a lot of opportunity. I've been offered, um, yeah, I've just been offered opportunity and I've also learned a lot of skills. So what am I going to do with this? And how am I going to really make this work? Because now I've got a lot of I've got a lot of grit in the game <laughs> and I've, I have a lot of people who have helped me get here. And that's when I started learning the business model of bringing the work online. Cause I wanted to work with a broader range of people. And that is a whole other thing, as I'm sure, you know, Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's come back to this. I wanna, there's something I want to ask you first, actually, which is 
often you talk about the sort of two main sides of your education. So there's the somatic side and there's the sort of PT side, education, you know, movement science, that kind of side. It's often a bit looked down on in the somatic territory, you know, like, oh, that's just exercise, that's just physical. But as you say, there's, it strikes me there's some real gifts in there, like running a business seriously. Any PT would just regard that as like, we well, have to, you know. Um, what, what other sort of gifts have you, have you brought from that, that side of things? I would say uh, principles of program design, uh, principles of adaptation and specificity, movement sequencing, how to create adaptation, how to really move somebody from where they are now and help them within a very specific period of time, whether that be six weeks or whether that be three months, move to the next level, wherever it is that they wanna go. As a dancer, I can remember that, you know, I mean, part of continuing to, especially as become a professional dancer, you're just looking at perfecting your technique in any way that you can, one, so that you don't get injured, and two, so that the aesthetic or the expression that's within you can be translated more readily through this instrument. Um, and being stuck, anyhow, for years being stuck in some like particular technical dimensions. Went over to personal training and literally within six weeks changed my performance metrics in ways that I was never given in dance science. And they think in terms of like metrics and improvement and like 20% stronger and like, like it's a different way of thinking. I can track it on various models. I know like spiral dynamics and stuff, but it's, um, that way of thinking is sometimes a bit missing, isn't it, from the somatic world? You know, like, like if you say, well, who's more embodied, person X or person Y? People would go, people would probably laugh and say, oh, you can't measure that and it doesn't matter. And it's very, they give some hippie bullshit, basically. But actually, there is a, such a thing as being more or less embodied. And you could, in fact, attempt to measure that in different ways. So that, that it seems to be the exercise science side of things is big on measurement and improvement. And while that can be taken too far... And there's some things that can't be measured, of course. There's something in that, right? I mean, I, I'm all about the polarities of life, Mark. So like one of the polarities we're talking about right now is a process-oriented way of being in movement practice or a goal-oriented way of being mm -hmm. in movement practice. And for me, it's like, wouldn't we like to have the choice? Mm -hmm. And if I'm actually helping somebody, they come to me and they want to go through some kind of change process. For me, I have a lot more confidence and I have a bigger toolbox when I actually can pull from both sides of this movement education spectrum. I can work from the inside out and I can also work from assessment and analysis from the outside in. And the two together are brilliant. Yeah, and it's a nice, it's a nice to be able to move. So process orientation is great, isn't it? Because you can just be in the process and not try to strive for anything and allowing space for things to arrive creatively, spontaneously. But you can get lost in that. And a goal orientation is great for going somewhere, achieving something, moving towards a target, you know, actually making some progress. But it can get a little bit graspy. It can miss the journey for the destination. You know, like sometimes I'm in the gym and I see people and they're just trying to lift a heavier weight. And I'm thinking, you're not even enjoying that. You know, they've missed the, they've missed the process. So, yeah, being able to move between those two certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's even the language of, attention and intention, right? Those might be kind of a better language structure to, to play with, but I think that it has the same tension. Attention and intention has the same tension. Wow, there's a little rhyme right there. But, you know, this place of being in the moment as it's arising and kind of going with it and allowing for those things to unfold or saying, hey, I'm going to direct my conscious intention and I'm going to choose this. Nice. Yeah. Are there any sort of main aspects of your work that maybe I don't know about or that you just want to bring in? Like what would be something that's kind of key to your, your orientation that you want, to, you want to bring in here? I mean, I think one of the most exciting things right now is biotensegrity. It is absolutely the most exciting thing that we've got going in the movement education world. And um, I'm really happy to say that, you know, at this point, the work that the Soma Kinney School does is biotensegrity informed. And um, yeah, it's it just, uh, yeah, it's been an amazing few years, uh, really beginning to unpack this complex system science and move from classical anatomy and biomechanics thinking into biotensegrity. Okay, do you wanna, I've come across this a little bit with some of the fascial people we've had on the show, but do you wanna briefly explain the difference between a kind of classical model and a biotensegrity model of human structure? 
Yeah, the way I think about it is that, you know, for what, probably the past three or 400 years, this, you know, classical biomechanics and anatomy has really developed because of how we've seen the way we make things and structures in our world, our buildings, our machines, our cars. Mm -hmm. It's like we see the way mechanics works successfully out here in hard matter physics and the physical world, and therefore we've determined that that is in fact how we are organized as well. So you see a building and you go, okay, they put bricks on top of bricks, it's compression forces, that must be how a human skeleton works because there's a house and houses stand up tall. Exactly. And so there's really been a science crafted, an evidence-based science crafted that has started from what we do out in our world and then to understand our human body has then applied that kind of me mechanistic thinking. But, you know, we are living, we're life, we're soft matter, which means that essentially we can the, the way our bodies respond is time dependent and force dependent. It's adaptable in the moment. It's responsive. So the, you know, my house that I'm in, I push the wall. It doesn't change the right. other structural bearing points. So, you know, biotensegrity is essentially the science that's looking at understanding our living anatomy. So for example, like you mentioned, we're not compression structure. And we know this, anybody who thinks about the spine as a compression structure will soon realize, oh, well, then how come I can do this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's happening there? For the podcast listeners. Yeah, for, for example, right? So, um, you know, so that what I would say about it is, the other thing I'll say about it, biotensegrity also makes a lot of sense in terms of its outlining principles that can be applied at every size scale from the organelle inside of a cell all the way to the organism. And it doesn't just describe us, it describes all of life. So these are really nature's principles. And it's interesting to think that we've developed an anatomy and a biomechanics model that has not aligned with the principles of nature and the rest of life. So just what is biotensegrity then? So it's biological tensegrity, do you wanna explain that? Um, you know, it's described different ways. The way I like to talk about it is it's structural design principles that are applied to our living architecture and our function and our form. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And this idea of tensegrity particularly, rather than the sort of compressive analogy of uh, bricks, you know, stacking up on a building in some sense of, uh, how would you describe that part? So the um, kind of the grandfather I've heard him called before, Dr. Stephen Levin, who really coined the term biotensegrity, Orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon of 40, 50 years or something like that. And he is the one who looked at the tensegrity models and the tensegrity architectural designs through Buckminster Fuller and, and Fuller student Kenneth Snelson and started looking at that model and going, oh, okay, that makes more sense in terms of biological organization than the compression structure of this building over here. And so taking the ideas from the tensegrity model and applying them to biological living being, he coined the term biotensegrity. Got it, thank you, thank you. And aside from the geek factor, which I can see is high and I respect that, it's not a word, <laughs> why is this exciting? What's okay, this so I've talked about how I'm a bridge person. You, yeah, and you mentioned yeah. like, that's where we're the same, right? So one of the bridges that I've been really wanting to make in movement education, is between here's the experience I have as a moving self and then here's the evidence-based science that tells me about how this moving self is organized and I've been looking to find I'm always looking for the rationale and the science I'm very big on the experience that I'm having and the relationship and the outcome that happens from exploration I also want the science I want the rationale I want to find it so Biotensegrity takes away the discrepancy mark. It literally is the bridge between the self I experience in movement and this organization that I intuit and experience through, uh, <laughs> through all of the many ways that I've moved and what I have learned from myself. And then also the principles of organization that we can look at objectively 
it's, it's the bridge between the two. There's no discrepancy. It's always been a discrepancy for me. I mean, I've been teaching anatomy and biomechanics for years. You know, I've taught in personal training schools. I've taught in universities. And <clears throat> there's always a way that I would keep certain things out. Why am I going to teach levers? Levers doesn't do anything for us. It doesn't help me at all as a movement teacher to understand levers. And it doesn't make any sense. So I always kind of went more towards the structural kinesiology, again, form and function, and how we can relate this to what we feel inside as an organized self and what I can see from the outside in terms of assessment. Biotensegrity takes away the discrepancy between the two. Nice, nice. The bridge, the suspension bridge between the Yeah. Uh, cool. Any other sort of major chunks of your work that we haven't touched upon yet that you think... I should speak about that if I'm on the embodiment podcast. Hmm. I would say just speaking more to this vision, uh, Mark, of just being very called to co-create with other movement teachers, a new movement education model. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of the word that's arised in the community as I've been teaching online over the past two and a half years now has been embodied movement science. <laughs> Here's embodied in yet another way, but um, it's just this idea that we've been speaking to. It's like, how do we as teachers really take this knowing of the subjective, like the personal consciousness, this kind of somatic inquiry and everything that emerges and comes from this knowing, and then all of the science that's out there mm -hmm. that's telling us about how to teach movement and what function what's good function and what's poor function and how to create adaptation and, you know, to help people out of injury and all these things. So we don't have a movement education model yet that quite speaks to the combination of the arts and the sciences. So that's what we're building in intelligent motion training. And it's really exciting work. And, uh, you know, any movement teacher that's interested in really diving into that framework, um, they'll, they'll find it at the Soma Kinney School. Okay, so in terms of people looking for you online, that's Soma Kinese, S-O-M for Mark A, Kinney's K-I-N for November, E-S-E school uh, dot com. Well, it's, yeah, you, you can go to somakinese.com. My main website is kaylajune.com. I haven't that's changed like over that handle. But on Facebook and Instagram, it is Soma Kinese school. Oh, uh, there we go. So this is where I was getting confused. So I came from Kayla June, um, and it's also there. Okay, good, good. Cool, I find myself running out of steam today, which is absolutely nothing to do with you because this has been interesting and fun. Um, I think I've just hit a wall today energy-wise, so I want to kind of wrap up before I just start nodding and I lose the ability to, to talk intelligently. So um, anything, anything here to finish up, Gayla? I appreciate you having me on the, the podcast, Mark. Uh, this is what it's all about for me is connecting, relating, learning from new people and... Um, you know, continuing to evolve this work for the greater good of humanity and beyond. There we go. Nice. And I do recommend your online classes. So um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Mark.